Hi, guys, and welcome to the Empower Dog International Dog Trainer Summer Summit. I'm Yoram Adaris. I am streaming live from Sunset Beach. It's pretty sunny today. Where are you guys from? Tell me, drop it in. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Let me know where you're streaming in from. We have an amazing day today, what I called earlier an epic day here at Empowered Dog Headquarters. This is the headquarters for those of you that said the other background was the headquarters. This is the headquarters as far as I'm concerned. But anyways, I have an amazing co-host for you today. You guys are going to love it. Drop it in the comments. Can you see me? Can you hear me, hear me before I pull my co-host up? I want to hear from you. And if you see, if you're streaming from Facebook, you're going to see a little link that says basically like, click this button, click this button. Hey, thank you. She missed. Thank you. Thank you. And you're from Ohio. Awesome. So if you click that button, we've got Lisa Hills, Hills here from YouTube. You can tell it's from YouTube. And right here we have a little Facebook logo. If you click that little link, I'm able to see what your picture is and then who, who we're talking to. Yes, Jenna, thank you. All right, co-hosting with me today, it's the one and only Michelle Dart. Michelle hey. is back in the house. So excited hey, to have you back here. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's great to be back. Um, I just wanna reach out to everyone who's tuning in right now and thank you all so much for the incredible support and heartfelt messages you guys have been sending from all over. Um, I have just been blown away by the huge amount of support that I am receiving from literally every corner of the world. You guys are amazing. Um, Logan is having a very chilled out evening today. So he's just kind of snoozing. I've got mum on, you know, looking after him. So I can uh, be here with you guys and enjoy what is gonna be the most phenomenal day. It's, yeah, some really amazing presentations lined up today. So Michelle, before I have you go into the back and you get to play the back side of this, uh, let us know who are the speakers today. Oh, we've got some real treats for you. Okay, so first up right now, in a few moments time, we have the incredible Julie Fryman coming in to talk all about reactivity and trick training. We then later on have Michael Shikashio joining us in the studio. And to finish off an epic day, we have the one and only Ian Dunbar finishing up the roll call tonight. So, woo, an amazing lineup if I've ever seen one. Well, it's so, I'm so happy that you're back here. It feels really good to have my partner in crime right next to me. If you guys don't know already, Michelle and I are the co-founders of Empower Dog. If you haven't seen it, check out the website. There's a lot of really cool stuff on there, events. We have the winter summit. That's some of those videos are still up. And then yeah, if you, you want to check out the full lineup, Line up for even the summer summit is right there right now. And if you have it, you missed a, a video or you're, you weren't, you had to go to work for, I don't know knows why you had to go to work. <laughs> you need to work to stay here and watch the summit. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you missed a speaker. Those links are up and you can always watch the video right there. That's um, been already uploaded to YouTube. Is that right, Michelle? Absolutely, guys. And if any of those ever don't work, then come and harass us because something went wrong somewhere along the line. But yeah, they're all there ready for you guys to just catch up. Um, you can post your comments underneath if you're coming back in and we get the speakers to do a little turn around and have a look to, to answer those as well. So. Well, thanks for being here, Michelle. I'm going to bring you over to the back. And oh. Oh, I didn't give her a chance to say bye. Sorry. <laughs> bye, guys. I'll be in the back. <laughs> All right, guys, we have Julie Fryman in the house. When I first met Julie, uh, she was a student at the Karen Pryor Academy. I was there assisting Nan Arthur, which I want to give a shout out to Nan Arthur. She is in San Diego, and I miss talking to her. But Julie was in class, in, in Nan's class for... Um, for the Karen Pryor Academy. My oldest son, Curtis, was also there. And I really got a chance to get to know Julie. And I knew she was a gem. And I reached out as soon as she was done, as soon as she finished her course, like kind of along the way, you know, sneaking out, oh, what are you going to be doing after this? And uh, I had my eye on her the whole time. So Julie runs my pet training business, Canine Learning Academy. Um, I've off, you know, as you know, stepped away and worked with Empowered Dog. Um, and Michelle and basically creating content for trainers, but um, 
Julie runs the entire Canine Learning Academy. Um, she, I just assist on the back side of it. So I'm super excited to have Julie. Let me go ahead and bring her up. Hey, Julie. Hey, hey guys. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. This is such a great summit. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I am so pumped. Today's presentation is going to be a ton of fun. I hope that you guys enjoy it and, and enjoy listening. And um, hopefully we can get some interaction in about a month with the, a special free gift at the end for you guys. Yeah, you guys are going to want to stay tuned. She's got an amazing gift, something a little different, where it involves you bringing your dog, which I love. Yes. So, Julie, I got to ask you, how did you get into dog training? Because I know you had a different path, and I've heard this story, but I absolutely love this story. So let's, I want to hear you. I want to have everyone hear where your story and where your journey started. Yeah, so um, right after I got out of the Peace Corps in the Philippines, I moved to Cal Southern California. My parents were living here. Um, I really needed a outlet for this passion, for this drive to help other people. And so I went and started volunteering at the Pasadena Humane Society. Um, and I worked with neonatal kittens and puppies, so brand new baby babies. Uh, and I absolutely loved going to work every single day. It was so exciting. It was something different. It was a new challenge. I learned so much so quickly. And so I progressed from a volunteer to an assistant to a coordinator. Um, and then after I left that position, I just had so much love and drive for the chaos and the passion and the learning of animals and medicine and behavior that I went straight into Karen Pryor Academy to get everything that I could and um, start my new life with my beautiful puppy, Opal Blossom, who also came from the shelter with me. Tell us a little bit about Opal, because I know she was a big um, the big reason why you got into dog training, what about her was different than what you saw with other dogs? Like you, I guess she was a foster failure. Is that right? She was a foster failure. Yes. She was one of the, I think, 500th animal that I was able to care for in the foster program. Um, she was just so remarkable as a puppy. I would give her puzzles to solve and it would be done in an instant. She the bond that we had was instantaneous. I would sing her Disney songs and she would fall asleep in my lap and we would just do all of these fun training events, like training activities, even at such a young age, I could tell that she was very intelligent, um, feisty, very sassy, much like her mom. And so there was so much fun that we could get into and also a little bit of trouble along the way. So I actually have a, a nice slide in my presentation all about the wonders of Opal Blossom as well. Aw. And before we get started, can you let us know um, what is your presentation going to be about and who would be inspired? Like if you if you got to wish this on someone and they took your presentation and they said, oh, my gosh, I am just totally I loved it. I really got this out of it. What do you hope to accomplish by your presentation? What the impact do you want it to make? Yeah, so I know that with a reactive dog or when you're working with reactive dogs, it can get to be a bit uh, overwhelming and you feel sometimes like you can't do anything right or maybe your dog is just really limiting your lifestyle. And that is so not true. I want you guys to know that there's so many other activities that you can be passionate about besides just going outside and doing a traditional dog walk. So today we're gonna reach out to those parents, to those trainers that are getting a little bit bogged down and don't feel like they're making a lot of progress because there's so much more that we can do with play, with fun, um, with excitement, and hopefully re-motivating you to get out and try something new. Oh, I can't wait. All right. I'm excited. Are you excited? Let me hear it from you guys in the audience. Drop it in the comments. Give her some love. Julie Fryman, let's <laughs> get this party started. Awesome. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pull up your presentation. I will probably go into the back and uh, click away. Let me know if you need anything. I am right here to uh, talk to you. So you've got myself, you've got the audience, and you've got Michelle running the back show. Are you good? I'm good. Let's get it started. All right. So today is go. all about tricks and treats. So I was actually born the day before Halloween, so I love trick or treating. But today we're going to talk about tricks and treats, um, the alternative exercise for reactive dogs.
So I am Julie Fryman. Uh, like Yo said, I am a Karen Pryor Academy certified training partner. Um, I'm a certified behavior adjustment training instructor as well as the general manager and head trainer at Canine Learning Academy. And that beautiful dog on the side, that is my opal blossom that you're gonna be hearing all about. So when we're talking about reactivity, and anxiety, which go hand in hand. So anxiety is often the fear of the future. It's when we live in the worst case scenario. What if, what if, what if, what's coming next, right? So this is really often exacerbated by prolonged stress, both physical and mental. And when I say physical, I mean, often I see a lot of reactive dogs being over exercised because the parents are trying to drain that energy out so that they can hopefully lessen the reactions when sometimes it creates a rebound effect and we end up driving our dogs back into overstimulation. So overstimulation, too much noise, sound, light, exposure, poor diet and sleep patterns, right? Not always the, the best uh, diet for that kind of dog. If we're having a lot of carbs, uh, certain kinds of allergies can aggravate this. And uh, lack of management, even for people, right? Not managing our time, not managing our locations, not managing the people around us and how they affect our anxiety patterns. So anxiety-based reactivity can be genetic. Dogs can be born with it. It can be situational, like they're associating it with a particular area, person, time of day. It can be habitual, meaning they practiced it over and over. And the only way we get better at a behavior is we practice it. Unfortunately, that happens for the, the other side of behavior as well or compulsive, meaning it's out of their control, their body takes over, and we're unable to interfere because there's something going on in this, something misfiring in the neurons. So really common signs of anxiety in dogs are lack of appetite, a lot of skinny, skinny dogs out there that are just not getting enough nutrients, um, inconsistent sleep patterns, Hypervigilance, paranoia is what we call it in people, but hypervigilance, constantly searching for what's coming next. The inability to settle or be in a, independent, right? So dogs that follow us around the house or are constantly unsettled during the day, right? They're uh, compulsive behaviors. I've had dogs pull out the, the, t the hair in their tails, chase their tails repetitively, jumping, barking, and just not able to interrupt that behavior. And then a lack of focus, which I know can be really, really frustrating for a lot of owners who don't have that background education. Why is my dog ignoring me? Why can't they focus? They know how to do this behavior. A lot of times when that anxiety comes in, all of that previous training or intelligence or learning can sometimes uh, seem like it goes out the window when really it's lying dormant. So cognitive behavioral therapy, this is what we use especially for people who have high anxiety or who have chronic panic attacks. This means taking part in the mindset of calming yourself down along with often therapy and medication. Cognitive behavioral therapy can change our brain's patterns and how we learn to create new patterns, hopefully healthier patterns in our diets, in our daily tasks, in our thinking, right? Not living in that worst case scenario. So the most important parts of cognitive behavioral therapy are completing quick and easy tasks. I love a good list. Sometimes when you're feeling overwhelmed, just writing down a list of all the things you have to do so you can have some checks. Right, reducing the overall stimulation. When your anxiety comes up, it's often a good time to find a quieter space, a darker space, a cooler space, so that we can reset the external stress while you're processing the internal stress. Remaining in the present, this one is so important. Not worrying about what you did wrong in the past or what might go wrong in the future, but instead taking note of what's actually going on right this moment by 
you know, seeing and hearing and, and being wherever you are in that moment instead of thinking 10 steps ahead and what might go wrong. Finding someone to support you. This is the most important thing for people and for dogs. Finding that support, whether it's talk therapy, whether it's practice, whether it's someone sending you workbooks to work through cognitive behavioral therapy. If only we could give that to our dogs. Oh, wait, we can, and you're going to find out how. And then constructive repetitive actions. So not just twirling your hair or pacing. We know through tons and tons of research that playing constructive repetitive actions like video games, going for a run, um, washing the dishes, cleaning your house, these things actually create a positive momentum that you can build on to get out of that hole that seems like you're sometimes trapped in with your anxiety. So we're going to talk about how we can use cognitive behavioral therapy with our dogs with tricks. So this is my reactive dog experience. So like I said before, this is Opal Blossom. She is a sheepdog, pit bull, husky, five other breed mixes. She's a shelter mutt, and I just love her so much. She's beautiful. She's very unique looking. Um, but when she reacts to triggers in the environment, she makes a huge, big, intimidating display. She shows her teeth, she rah, 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 she lunges forward, and it uh, it can scare people, even that know her really, really well. This big display can be very sudden and jarring, making it look like she's dangerous or aggressive when really she's quite fearful and she's anxious about what's going on. So it was when we were first starting out and living together, it was really difficult living in a busy city and finding a calm spot to practice walking, to practice what we needed to for the Karen Pryor Academy. Um, I knew that she was smart. She learns skills very quickly. She picks things up. She trains me all the time and herds me around the house. So she even graduated Karen Pryor Academy with me. So I know that the intelligence, the smarts, the ability to learn is there. That means that there's something else in the environment or that I'm doing that is causing her to be overreactive be uh, over displayed to make other things change around her. So I felt really guilty and I, I just didn't like walking my dog anymore. She's huge. When she pulls and she reacts, it can sometimes be dangerous for me because I'm strong, but I can't always predict exactly when she's going to go off. So I was no longer having fun walking with her. And I really felt guilty as an owner not being able to do that all the time because society puts a big pressure on us for that. So she loves to play. She loves frisbee and ball and agility and all of these things and she loves to dance if i put on music she absolutely must be up and dancing with me so i wanted to see how i could channel that energy that aerobic exercise into meeting her vast exercise needs because she is a mix of a lot of high energy dogs So one of the things that we talked about for cognitive behavioral therapy, quick and easy tasks. So I've had owners tell me, well, my dog doesn't really know tricks. And I'll say, okay, let's, let's just write down exactly what your dog does know how to do. Can they make eye contact? Okay, we can turn that into something. Can they give you a paw? Can they put their chin down? Can they stand there very still? Wow, all of those things are things that my dog can do. So if we're making a list, we're going to come to a different mindset of what our dog can do rather than all the things we feel like they can't. So practicing shaping behavior, we take those tiny, tiny successes, right? Can my dog hold something in their mouth like Bentley here? Can my dog stare straight forward? lick their lips like this little guy in the corner. One of my favorite things 
that um, I put on cue for Opal was the head tilt that she has demonstrated in this picture over here. She will, if I ask her if she likes football, because I'm from Texas, she will tilt her head for an adorable picture or a moment of laughter and joy. So reinforcing any and all attempts, making sure that they're succeeding along the way. No one likes to fail, including our dogs. So setting really small, simple tasks can help build their confidence really quickly, can help you see what they actually can do and focus on building those tasks rather than what you feel like you're not doing or what your dog can't do, right? We need to change it from a threat to a challenge, right? This is a challenge to see how many of these tiny, tiny behaviors that you can get and then build upon to create these magnificent tricks and routines. So um, on the left, we have Bentley. This is called the bucket game, where he's able to stare straight forward at a bucket while he's being groomed or handled. So I do truly believe that your dog can look at a bucket for one single second. So if we can reward your dog for looking at that bucket for one second, we can help to build that to two, three, four, five, and then get into some cooperative veterinary care, which can be really important in lowering stress and anxiety around grooming and vets. Success is reinforcing. Absolutely, Ellen, I love that. Success is reinforcing in itself. Reducing the overall stimulation. So you don't have to take your dog outside around busy streets, around cats and squirrels, around skateboards that might set them off at any moment, right? We can practice in our backyard. We can practice in our house. You can actually get your trick title online through the AKC or through Do More With Your Dog if you're out of the country. I'm sure that there are other uh, organizations that offer, also offer trick training titles that are really easy to just do under low stimulation in your house. So it limits the trigger exposure, which is heightening that stress and arousal. And it also reframes intelligence. And what I mean by that is my dog can do 50 things inside. And then we step outside and often it feels like, well, my dog's being stubborn. My dog's not listening. My dog doesn't want to do this when actually they're feeling overwhelmed, they're feeling anxious, they're feeling hyper vigilant about things that are going on around them. So there's a lot of things that we can do to limit the exposure to triggers, which are overstimulating, to get our dogs under threshold and competing or challenging or creating these trick master routines under the conditions that they feel most comfortable. So Julia, I'd love, I absolutely love this. Can I ask you a quick question? Go for it. All right. Uh, guys, just, just so you know, questions you can ask along the way, um, put a big capital Q on it, but real quick question. You hear this a lot. My dog is being stubborn. What would you prefer as a dog trainer? What would you prefer them to either say to describe what's going on with their dog or to actually feel? What is the emotion you'd rather have that pet parent feel? Absolutely. So instead of my dog is stubborn, which puts all of the fault on them and automatically puts you in a negative mindset. Well, my dog is being stubborn, so they're working against me. Instead, we should be thinking about, well, is my dog able to focus in this environment? Is my dog feeling stressed or overwhelmed? What is the environmental factor that may be causing this disconnect in communication between me and my dog instead of it's me versus my dog in this environment? So you can really take note of all of those things when you're inside and then slowly transitioning those skills that your dog knows really well, those quick and easy tasks when you go back outside and evaluate, well, why is my dog not able to do this instead of why is my dog just not doing this for me? So what I'm hearing you say is when we, when, when a pet parent says my dog is stubborn instead, maybe think that the dog doesn't feel safe. 
And that's why right. there's not a lot going on, right? They're not, they're not Absolutely. listening. They're not hearing you. They're just not feeling safe. I love that. Perfect. All right. Carry on. <laughs> Absolutely. So another one is remaining in the present, right? If we're thinking about the future and what's going to happen or the past and how we failed or we haven't succeeded, we're not remaining present with our animals. We're not actively observing and listening to their needs as well as our responsibilities. So as a human, remaining in the present means active listening, not only to our dogs, but having our dogs actively listen to us. So trick training can involve what we call behavior chains. And that means one, two, three, four, five behaviors in a row. But we often take them and mix them up. So you can see Bentley here in the center video. He's recycling different things that are on the ground. And we're cueing him on what he should be bringing us. So it's not just go and get anything that we put out. He's having to actively listen to instructions. We would like this thing versus that thing. So the video at the bottom left for me, and I don't know if it's flipped for everyone else, but at the bottom left, this is Opal combining some really simple tasks that we often reorder over and over again to keep her actively listening, to keep her participating and in the moment so she just doesn't offer a sit and a paw. Sometimes I throw a sit and a go through and a spin and all of these other really simple things that she knows how to do, but I rearrange them so that she doesn't get complacent. And it's a focus thing, it's making sure that I'm in that moment with her. I'm thinking through what she can do and how I need to cue it in the next moment. And it just actively changes our body language. I mean, you as a human stand up straighter. When we succeed, we our whole body lights up. Our hormones change. We smell different. We look different. You can tell um, Curtis over here, which is Yo's oldest son, is is sometimes he's very introverted and he can be very serious. But when he works with a dog, it melts my heart how much he smiles, how straight he stands up, how confident he becomes because he's having fun and he's actively engaging in what's going on in that moment instead of worrying about, well, we're going to do loose leash walking next and this dog isn't good at that. Well, that may be true, but right now what you're working on, they are good at, and we should celebrate that moment instead of constantly living in the past or in the future. So having fun and playing keeps us exactly where we're supposed to be focused on the right now. Finding a partner to support you. This is probably my favorite part of trick training is that it involves both of you. The human mechanics are as important as your dog's ability to do these tricks. Sometimes we will be a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right and the dog will look at us and go, I don't, I don't know what you're asking for. So it really helps with that instant feedback. It's about the both of you. And when you have a reactive dog, a lot of the focus is on them, what they're doing or what they're not doing or what they're going to do. But when you have a partner, you have to look at what am I doing in this situation? Not just how am I helping or hurting, but what is my body language saying? Am I taking one step too far? Am I doing this with my right hand or my left hand? The responsibility is about the partnership instead of just my faults or my dog's faults. So here on the top left is one of my reactive dog clients. Something so, so simple, which is go up to a platform and lay down. Doing that has brought them so much joy in the park that now this is a part of their daily routine. And instead of bark, bark, bark at every dog that goes by, the dog will actively go up on the bench and sit and people watch. So a simple trick like up or platform has given them the ability to add distance, 
to have something simple to focus on and to reframe it as a partnership instead of just training the dog, we're also working with the human. And I love this picture down at the bottom because uh, this is our, our one of our dogs that's been with us for the longest time, Molly. And she's literally supporting me on this paddleboard. That was my first time ever paddleboarding and she knew how to do it, I didn't. So putting her into a middle, a peekaboo position, she already knew what she was doing. So she was helping me out in that situation. And then I had to help her by being stable and continue moving. So it looks really awesome in the still photo, but uh, actually we are physically supporting each other on this board so that we can work together on our balance, on our movement, and you know, taking this epic photo out on Lake Tahoe, which was so much fun. I so remember this picture, uh, Julie. I was, <laughs> I was teaching at the the Tahoe camp, and it was uh, paddleboarding and kayaking. And I just assumed Jody, or I was assuming Julie knew how to paddleboard. So I'm like, hey, will you go out there first and, you know, get them going? And, you know, Molly's done it a plenty of times. And it, this look on her face as she's starting to, like, go out, she's like, yo, I have never paddleboard before. So this was hilarious. Disclaimer, I'm a really good kayaker. I've just never paddleboarded before. So the dog is literally supporting me. And I have to support her balance by not taking us both overboard. And even another trick that I'm doing at the bottom left with my dog is a moving nose target. So supporting her by redirecting her vision while we're walking, instead of turning her directly into the trigger or even trying to step in front of her so she can't see something, I'm actively working with her on turning her head to the left or the right, which is seems like a simple trick, but doing it on the go and making sure we're practicing it before there are triggers present can really help anticipate what might happen down the road. So if she's actively focused on me and I'm actively focused on her, we're much more likely to be able to get past that distraction or that possible trigger together instead of me just yanking her away and hoping that she adds the distance by herself. repetitious actions, right? We talked about that with humans, but repetitious actions help calm us down. There's a lot of research that shows that we love patterns. All animals love patterns. We actively seek them out. That's why we like video games. That's why we like watching the same TV show over and over because there's familiarity there and it brings us comfort. So success takes a lot of practice. You can't just do a trick once and be an expert. You need practice, practice, practice with your dog. So taking it inside, then outside, then front door, then across the street, street. That takes a lot of repetition over time. And that's how you build that strength and muscle. That's also how we can exercise our dogs outside of just walking, running, and playing ball, which are the typical ones that I come across with most owners. They're trying to just run, run, run their dog out so that they can get a minute of peace. Instead, excitement doing other things with their muscles, right? Yoga is also a good exercise, but sometimes we only think, sometimes we think that you have to run or you have to sprint to make sure that you get your exercise in during the day. But everyone has a different skill set. So even doing one or two reps and then going in and coming back out and doing another two reps, depending on the skill, so the bottom right is a dog is a border collie who was pretty overweight at the time that I met her, but her her parents weren't even able to take her outside and walk her without a big display and spinning and and chasing after cars. So we had to come up with some alternative exercises to make sure that she was able to lose the weight in a constructive way. So the trick we're using is up and off up and off, 
right? Just like in Jazzercise, she's jumping up on a platform, she's jumping off of the platform, jumping up, and that increases your heart rate, which means you are aerobically exercising. So you're burning calories while you're increasing focus and doing it together. Same with the dog on the left who is running around the trees. She's doing um, what we call a wraparound. So the owner gets to stand still whether you have mobility issues or uh, you know your joints are swollen, things like that, where you can't actively run in agility, you can teach your dog to go out away from you and come back. And doing it over and over again, you can see how this might be a more constructive exercise for a herding dog who's made to juke back and forth than just walking in a straight line. All of these things have muscle movements. You can see this tiny puppy. He's so, so excited to go one, two, three paws in a row, which means that we're building that muscle in his arms while I have the ability to stand still and not have to over-exercise myself. So this is really great for senior clients, for people who have mobility issues, for people who have injuries. You don't have to stop exercising your dog just because you can't get out and walk or run. There's other ways that we can build that relationship and make sure that they're still getting that mobility and strength training that doesn't have to do with running necessarily. Julie, we got a few questions. You mind answer them along the way? Is that cool? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. All right, Sherry says, uh, and her question is, while out and about to your reactive dog or with your reactive dog, have you been cueing the natural knee-jerk reaction so the dog thinks it's fun and not to worry? Hmm. Um, I'm not entirely clear on the question. If I could get some clarification, Sherry, about the knee-jerk reaction, um, because I, I will cue a trick like a, a nose touch on the go many, many, many times before we're in the presence of triggers. So it does take practice before you're in the presence of those triggers for it to become an automatic reaction. But I, I hope that I'm answering that question correctly. Uh, if, if you could clarify what you mean by the knee jerk reaction. Hi guys. I was just wondering whether it was to do with um, the natural responses that, you know, we might go through when we're in that situation with a reactive dog and that we might start acting naturally as a knee jerk response to that situation in a particular way and whether you go through um, that process. I have never heard that term knee jerk. So I was like, what is she <laughs> Must saying? be a oh, <laughs> Must mean, be British. <laughs> I know knee-jerk reaction. Um, I'm just thinking of whether it's the dog or the human's knee-jerk reaction. But the the human, absolutely, it takes as much practice for us to rewire our brains in what we feel might, um, you know, how people quickly yank back on the leash. Absolutely. I've had to show people when their dog runs away yeah. that it's actually better for you to run away. But oh my gosh, what kind of practice that takes to rewire our brain instead of going, yep. Fido, come! And instead make <laughs> it a game of chase to get chase. your dog back yeah. safely. So absolutely, it takes so much practice, but the fun of tricks is so reinforcing for us people because not only are you succeeding, but the smiles, like I said, the body language that you're producing changes your brain chemistry into thinking about what your dog can do in these situations. So you're much less likely to have what, what we would perceive as a negative reaction to their reaction and instead think about what are the possibilities that we could do in those situations. Absolutely, I love that question. Thank you so much. Love that response, yes. Great response too, Julie. So Philly says, when there is a disabled dog or with illness or any physical damage and they are not able to jump, let's just say on a bench, besides doing other tricks, how long will you do them for? I think you kind of answered that when you responded earlier, but go ahead and just respond to this question as it is here up on this uh, screen. Yeah, so uh, the, the jumping up and down on the bench is just one example. Even having them do um, cavalettis, 
which is walking over the, the poles very gently to, to work on their stride or their balance, um, sitting down and offering a paw just on the floor. All of these things they're able to stretch out. It just depends on the disability or the, the illness of the dog. So you always want to work at their pace and their ability level, but there's a lot of different exercises and we're going to talk about that in my master class that we can do with even our senior dogs that don't have a huge range of jumping or running. There's a lot of things that we can do. Um, I've even had a dog in physical therapy that we taught to put their nose to their hip. So they were doing side crunches to help heal their abdomens. And that's something that they can do totally still and without a lot of leg work. Yeah, just that head movement. I love that. Even yeah, Any head yeah. movement like you were doing with the nose target, just side to side, forward just side and back, to side. beautiful. Yeah. And it's good. Michelle, is there any other therapy. questions? Absolutely. Mobility. Anytime you can get the dog, just absolutely just moving a little bit. All right. We'll go to one more question, Michelle. And Jeanette, let me know if I said it correct. And Jeanette, I'm going to say it's a beautiful name. And Jeanette. Yeah, it's beautiful. So what can you do when the turning and walking away doesn't work? The dog turns and the stop response stops responding and then reacts anyways. Ooh, I like this one. And you know what? This is really common. What does that mean? Love it. Great question. So a lot of times when we're trying to cue or do one of these, um, oh, yes, you did get her name right. That's awesome. When we're trying <laughs> to cue in the middle of these triggers, let's say your dog does the the trick or the cue that you've asked for, and then they turn back and overreact. Super common. That may mean that one, we need to practice that in a less stimulating environment so we can get more movement in the direction that we're wanting, or we need to add a lot more distance. So even using that head turn, we can have the head turn and then continue that moving target to where we're getting them at least 10, 20 feet away from what could be triggering or bothering them. So it's not all stationary. Some dogs can handle a stationary behavior while they're working on these things. Some dogs need much more space and much more time in between triggers and, and things that are overstimulating. So we can use these one or two things, but we can also build them, like I was saying before, into behavior chains to a head turn and then going much farther following a moving target. That would be the example for that particular case. Good. So I'm hearing you say it's kind of a little bit of mark and move. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right? Some mark and move. Okay. Mark and move, or either you might be create need to create a little more space, or the environment itself is just not quite the right environment for this dog to have had enough repetitions of, of pretty much listening to what you're asking for. Right, right. right. So you may need to, to practice in less stimulating environments, not just in your house, but in your backyard and in someone else's backyard and then in your front yard, and then taking it out into those more distracting environments. Absolutely. All right, we'll get back to your presentation. Again, if you've got questions, just type the letter Q. They're much easier for us to find. Michelle's looking for them. And if you can bring me back into the back room, Michelle, and we'll let Julie carry it on. Carry on. I put winter summit. I'm so sorry. This is the summer summit free gift. So this is uh, my free gift to all of you who are here in the summer summit. I apologize for that. We're going to be having a live and interactive masterclass. So actually taking the, the treats and the tricks that you've been seeing in this, and we're going to take them, teach them, and then talk to you about how to use them productively out in the environment. Whether you're a trainer, whether you're a pet parent, whether you're a dog walker and you often experience these things when you're out and about, there are things that we can do to help refocus our dogs 
build that bond and then utilize those tricks or behaviors into creating progress in our reactive dog training. So we'll be talking about useful tricks for living and working with reactive dogs, uh, practicing live. So we're going to have the dogs practicing live via Zoom where you're going to get trainer coaching on how to uh, up level those skills or even just how to break them down into really simple tasks. And then of course there's going to be a live Q&A at the end to go over anything and everything having to do with trick behaviors and reactivity. So there's my contact information on the side. That's how you're going to get a hold to me of me. This gift will be recorded to watch later. Will it? I'm not sure. So we'll have to turn on that. <laughs> So we are going to be providing you guys a link uh, if you guys are if you guys are registered for the International Dog Trainer Summer Summit. You're going to get an email that has a link, and that is the link to Julie's gift, which is a registration to a live interactive class. As long as you're registered for that live class, it will be recorded, uploaded to YouTube, and then you will get the link to that. So if you want to watch it a little bit later, the interactive class means you can bring your dog with you. It is a long class. I think you said 90 minutes, 90 minutes. Yes. But we, so we will be working, we'll be talking, we'll doing some of the education, then we're going to get up and practice with our dogs. So if your dog is a workhorse, we can do the whole 90 minutes. If they get tired and we need to take breaks, that's also an option, but because it's going to be recorded, you can always go back and practice those skills wow. later. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've done that before. You have a tricks class on Saturday and I've had a, you know, I'm not able to get there at that time. So I just go and pop that recording in and do it with my puppy bandit who is doing amazing and I enjoy it. So I love it. Yeah. And, and using these skills for puppies and senior dogs, even if you're not experiencing overreactivity, it's still great muscle building. It's still great bonding. It's still great to have these skills in your toolbox for the possibility of an injury, for reactivity, for fear. We kind of never know what's going to come up in life. And that's the joy of the chaos of living is there's always unexpected twists and turns. So being prepared, whether you have a reactive dog already, you're working with reactive dogs, or you just want to have those things prepared and in your pocket for the possibility of any kind of change in your life. Dogs of all ages? Dogs of all ages Julie? are welcome. All the way yeah. from eight weeks up to 20 years or, or even older. I know that we have several senior dogs that come to our live tricks class and they have such a blast. We just create a, a safe working condition by adding some extra padding, lower impact exercises, alterations to the tricks. So I'm very, very mindful because I also, uh, my family has a 14 year old Boston who loves, loves, loves tricks training but obviously she's got some arthritis and, and those uh, injuries as she gets older. So we have to take things a little slower. Want you to know that we're going to make those adjustments live for you. And that's the benefit of the coaching live oh, cool. is so that I don't have to give every contingency. If your dog is there and they need that alteration, we can help you out with that in person. All right. So let's ask some questions. And I already know how you're going to respond to this because I know you. So Jody asked, what about other animals besides dogs? And in Jody's question, how about cats? Can you bring your cat to class? And we've had it. Yes, absolutely. So I worked with uh, shelter cats for a long time. One of the most beneficial things that we teach them is the paw, the high five, so that they can say hi to people in the window. It can create this really cute little way to get people's attention. Um, cats do need a different kind of reinforcement and maybe don't work as long for their people in certain circumstances. But we can definitely incorporate cats, rats, uh, rabbits. I've trained a fish. I know that Yo has worked with um, chickens. And so we, if you have an animal and you want to practice with them, bring them. That's the benefit of online training. That's awesome. Oh, what was your other you species? So what was your other species that you trained for KPA? 
uh, it was a betta fish. I actually taught my betta fish to swim through a hoop. So uh, the way that we train with positive reinforcement, especially with clicker training, which um, I adore using, shout out to Nan Arthur who helped us along the way with um, creating those other species practices. We, we have seen amazing tricks done with bunnies, rabbits, cats, dolphins, elephants, zebras, giraffes. If, you're, if your animal has a mind, we can help them <laughs> along the way. Um, I've never trained a snake or a reptile, but if there's someone on here who wants to try, go for it. Um, as long as I don't have to touch them, I'm more than happy to work with them. <laughs> Well, Julie, it's been wonderful having you this morning. You guys give her some love in the audience. Let her know that you enjoyed her presentation. And what a great gift, a live interactive class with their pet. That's going to be really fun. It's going to be fun to watch. Tell them a little bit about what you want them to bring to class, to the workshop. And if you can do me a big favor, if you don't mind just dropping in here over the next few days and reading the comments. If you're watching this a little bit later, typing hashtag replay will make it really easy for Julie to come and introduce herself and reach out to you. And if you've got a question, type in the big Q and Julie, look for those along the way on the comments um, on all three different feeds. Absolutely. All right. So, so question. The most uh, where can you register if uh, if you're already registered through the Empowered Dog Summit? You'll get an email follow up that has the link to register. And um, if we if there's some sort of disconnect, a Yo and Michelle will support with where to post the link. I'm sure that I'll end up dropping it into the members community at yeah. some point as well. So uh, what to bring to class? We always want to make sure that we have a non-slip surface something cushy for your dog to be on, to sit on, to relax, having some high value treats to make this a really fun experience, lots of water and a cool rest place so that your dog can hang out during the education and the talk portion. And then you need a, a camera, some sort of, uh, whether it's an iPad, a computer, your phone, we need to be able to see you to coach you. But if you just wanna come and listen, that's also totally okay. Great. And what about the expectation from the parent? Should they, I mean, if, if the dog's just not feeling it and they want to lay down, is that going to be okay? Absolutely. It's not every day <laughs> is a work day, right? We all have days where we're like, I just, I just can't today. It's a Monday and there's no way my brain will work. That's what the replay is for. So coming and listening, doing what you can, when you can, that's what this trick training is all about is doing what you can when you can with what you've small been pieces. given and that's yeah small pieces that we can do together awesome all right thank you and question many of my clients require a lot of convincing to see that games and tricks teach so much more than just insisting a dog sit and come do you have any tips for helping clients see the light faster if you were to just give and there's so many tips that julie that you've already provided one tip that you know will land, what would be that one tip that you can you could give Christina here? So instead of convincing them that tricks and games are an awesome way, sometimes I give them instructions along the way that they don't even know they're playing a game. So I'll have them recall the dog to a touch target and then have them do a spin. And then the next person that goes, I'll have them do a recall, a spin, and then go through your legs. A recall, spin, down, then go. So building up these tiny, tiny behaviors where they don't even really realize they're doing a trick routine and the benefit of their dog refocusing, getting excited about what they're doing and that active listening, it just shows itself while they're doing these little behavior chains. So if you can get them to do one thing treat, two things treat, three things treat, guess what? That's a trick routine and it's gonna show them how much more motivating it is for their dog rather than trying to convince them that tricks are a fun way of training. Show them, the proof is in the pudding and I promise their dog will have more fun and they will have more fun because they're seeing their dog succeed. 
Perfect. So Christina, um, let us know in the comments if that, um, if that resonates with you. Basically what I'm hearing you say, Julie, is not really to try to convince them, just ask them to do something with their dog, even eye contact, and then simply going, see that you got your dog's okay. attention. Right. Okay. Yes. yes Christina, awesome. I like so idea. if they can do one thing, then they can do two things. Then they can do three things. Guess what? They're in the middle of a routine and they don't even notice it. I don't even know it. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Julie, we're going to let you go ahead and start your Monday. I know you've got a full load of clients, all fully <laughs> loaded. Thank you so much for giving up your time so generously. And what nice. a fantastic gift that we're going to see. I guess that's going to be in two, three weeks, right? In about three yeah, weeks, yes. So there's the full masterclass that's going to be the 90 minutes of using the practical tricks for reactive dogs. We're going to learn them, practice them, and then show the different situations in which those can be useful. So the, all of the videos that you've seen, we're going to go in depth on how to do those tricks, when to do those tricks, and then how you can utilize them out in the real world. Beautiful. So again, that's going to be August 28th. They're going to be, there is going to be an invitation. And once you register, you'll have that recording, even if you can't make the live. Correct? Yep. That's absolutely. It. All right. See thank you guys. You, thank Give you Julie so much. Give Julie some love. You're thank welcome. you guys for coming. Thank, thank you. you. I will for chat listening. with you later. All right. Have thank a good you. one. And Michelle, I'm going to have you join me really quick as we talk about who is up uh -huh. next. That was a great presentation from my girl, Julie. You guys send her some love. She's also one of our youngest trainers um, that has been on the expert speaking uh, platform um, last winter. We were all proud of her presentation. And I think it was mostly about traveling with dogs, right? Yeah, oh man, yeah. that was awesome. If you haven't caught that, go and check it out. Have a look on the website. You can find everything under the Winter Summit. All of the links are there. So go and have a rewatch if you haven't seen that already. But man, that was great. That was absolutely brilliant. And the more we can get our dogs doing things. And I love, I love the whole keeping it simple and the way that that changes everything for both the dogs and for the humans they live with. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. So way to go, Julie, that was incredible. Um, and we love having you here. We are always happy to welcome you back. <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna take a short break and we will be back in about one hour with Michael Shikashio, he should be in the broadcasting studio in about 30 minutes. So grab a quick break, head to the loo. Is that how you say it, Michelle? The loo? You could call it the loo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> head to the restroom and we will be back in an hour. Looking forward to seeing you guys on back here in about, is it an hour? I don't even know what time yeah. it is. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's one hour from now. <laughs> All right. All, All right, right, guys. guys. Bye. Bye.